Transmitter device activating. Coordinate set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Earth 2 podcast, your weekly exploration of the DC Comics multiverse and the legacy of their Golden Age characters through the Silver and the Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter Watson. I'm Martin Gray. I'm Brandon Peters. I'm Dan Butcher. I'm Steve Higgins. I'm Ranger Gord Tolton. I'm Logan McFarlane. I'm Chuck Lordens. I'm Max Traver. I'm Rich Fulham. My name is Mick Pride. I'm Al Ewing. Well, I'm Frank Quitely. And I'm David Steele. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. We have reached part three of our journey through the Seven Soldiers of Victory's trip to the land of magic from Adventure Comics in the 1970s. Originally written in the 1940s for leading comics, 15, but unpublished until many, many years later and illustrated by a lot of contemporary artists. This week, we are bringing you the final segments from Adventure Comics 442 and 443. Very quickly tell you about cover to issue 442. Aquaman and some bad guys in a caption that reads, Can Aquaman stop a nuclear nightmare? H is for Holocaust. It certainly is. That guy on the left there looks like one of the guys that was eaten by the Barracuda in Adventure Comics a few months ago. Oh, it's nice of him to escape. Yes. Maybe it's his Earth One counterpart. <laughs> anyway, Adventure Comics 442, published on the 28th of August, 1975. We've already had chapters featuring The Shining Knight, Green Arrow and Speedy, The Crimson Avenger and Wing, and The Star Spangled Kid and Stripesy, and that suggests to me that there's only one hero left. Who could that be? It has to be The Vigilante, mm. and that means that we have to get someone very special back to voice The Vigilante, so without any further ado, let's have a caption for the splash panel for this chapter 6. The members of the Seven Soldiers of Victory continue their adventure in the wacky land of magic as... Vigilante finds himself on a bristling battlefield where he is to take an unwilling part in the weirdest of wars. Here he will learn that things are not always as they seem, and that his danger is all the greater because he would not choose sides and remained right in the middle of... No, no Man's, man's land. land. Yes, and we're given a further caption which tells us that once again the script was by... Joe Samichson, an art by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez and Mike Royer. Is this... No, it's not the first Garcia Lopez story we've done, is it? I think it is. Goodness me, and it's the vigilante fighting some gnomes. Okay, we are opening splash image, which shows poor Greg in his familiar blue denim shirt and red mask and white hat and denims and spurs and all that, standing on a rocky plain. There's a big sort of tall castle and a hill behind him. Rushing towards him on his left are some magical gnomes in costumes that kind of reflect aspects of human history. These guys they look a little bit on the barbarian side, and they're led by someone who appears to be wearing a hat that reminds me of Napoleon, quite frankly. <laughs> and on Greg's right, there's another army, wearing costumes that remind me a little bit more of Peter Pan via Robin Hood and Green Arrow, <laughs> but they're being led by a chap whose uniform looks a little bit more Prussian or Russian mm -hmm. in origin. So we have leapt right into the story. This is not a symbolic sort of splash image. This is basically where things kick off. So the caption for panel two reads, It's not the most wonderful place the vigilante finds in the land of magic. Now he knows how an umpire feels. Yes, the Prussian-looking chap in the red coat and the big Busby-style hat is pointing at his Napoleon-like counterpart and he's saying, Are you ready to begin the battle? And his opposite number in the blue replies, Yes, we... Wait a minute. What's that stranger doing here? And in the middle, tapping his forehead and looking very... <laughs> Very puzzled is our Greg Saunders, the vigilante, who says, Howlin' coyotes, I would pick a battlefield to sit down on. The leading soldier in red points at vigilante and says, I don't believe I've ever seen the likes of him before, General Diddle. Neither have I, General Twiddle. So let's nail that down. The guy in red is General Twiddle and the guy in blue is General Diddle. Make a note of that going forward. Vigilante attracts their attention in the next panel saying, Excuse me, amigos, but I don't mean to interrupt. I didn't even know any hombres like you were even fighting the war. General Twiddle, the man in red, replies, You didn't? Why, this is a very important war. Yes, indeed, stranger. This is a very important war. Why, we're fighting for a principle. We, Ganoofs, firmly believe that a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. To which General Diddle in blue says, And we foofs insist that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Which Greg says, Huh? But you're both saying the same thing. Oh no, we're right and they've got it backwards. 
No, we're right, and we'll prove it right now. <sighs> Sounds plumb loco to me. As a still baffled vigilante tries to make sense of this strange controversy... Yes, we see the two opposing sides rushing each other with their blades and pikes and swords and arms and stuff all ready. And Greg prepares his lasso, rings it above his head, saying, Great Gila monsters! They're attacking! Greg secures one man in his rope, thinking, I'd better rope him first and try to sort this out afterwards. But then he notices, Well, I'll be. He just shrunk out of my lariat. Yep, the, see the chap he's circled, shrinks him down and runs off. If the rope don't work, maybe a bullet will do the trick. Would you let pulls his pistol? And then he notices, Well, I'll be bushwhacked. There's hardly anything to shoot at. Because the figure he shot at has stretched up to a giant size with really long elongated limbs, torso and arms. He kind of looks like one of the, the Martians from Barzoom with only one set of arms, if you ask me. All along the battlefront, the strange creatures make their appearance, and suddenly... Yes, instead of stabbing each other with their swords and pikes and what have you, the armies of both sides are all lined up opposite to each other, and they're saying... Boo! 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 Vigilante off-camera says out loud, I'm hearing things. It sounds like they're trying to... We then see one of the really grotesque chaps on General Twiddle's side, pulling a really weird face, pulling his, pulling his lips apart and glowering at one of his opposite numbers, and he observes, Shucks, they didn't scare at all. And Vigilante, concluding his line of thought, says, They are. They're trying to scare each other. That's the only kind of fighting they're doing. That's right, stranger. Here's one of the, the gnomes leaping up onto Vigilante's shoulder. That's the only type of fighting we do, but you used weapons and that's not allowed. Yikes. And Vigilante thinks, Ugh, these varmints have got me. Yes, because we noticed that one of the guys, the one in red who was the second one to jump on, has wrapped his legs around Vigilante's own legs. And the other one, the first one, little chap wearing a yellow hat, has wrapped his whole body around Vigilante's torso, pinning his arms to his sides. Good grief. The little chap in yellow hat up top says, You'd better come with us and leave this battlefield or you're liable to get hurt. Shortly, the Western Crime Buster finds himself in an underground dungeon. Things are looking grim. Vigilante's sort of sat there thinking, Never seen anything like the way them coyotes changed their shapes. Sure wish I could do that. He gets a close-up here as he looks at his right hand, thinking, Them gnomes wouldn't have taken me so easy if I could just stretch like that. I'd have just stretched out my arms a couple of yards and jumping prairie dogs have done it. I can stretch. He's managed to stretch out his right arm and right hand so that the arm stretches and his hand grows to the enormous size. Fidge looks thoughtful in the next panel. Reckon there's something about this place that lets people change their shapes and I didn't even realize it. Well, this kind of simplifies things a mite. I'll just stretch out a bit and slip right through this little old keyhole. And that's what he does. He stretches himself all long and thin, and he stretches out through the keyhole, appearing on the other side, thinking, Ah, being able to change shape sure makes escaping a pleasure. Presently, and we see Vigilante making his way down the hill away from the castle that we saw in the opening splash image, that's obviously where he was incarcerated. He's making his way back down towards the, the conflict, as he thinks. Now to take care of them funny-looking hombres and settle this loco quarrel. Lariats and six-shooters ain't much good against them, but I reckon I know something that is. And with that, and this is completely unlike anything I've ever seen Vigilante do in any story, <laughs> because basically he transforms into a giant fly! but keeps his own head. Moments later, the most horrible monster ever seen in the land of gnomes makes a dramatic appearance between the two warring armies. Yes, this giant enormous fly with the head of a cowboy appears between the two armies and shouts, Boom! One little gnome screams and runs off. We see some of the other ones, one who looks very much like Green Arrow in the foreground, actually. Hmm. He's legging it as a pal behind him says, Will you uh, please change back? Another chap in a more military uniform says, We can't stay in the same country with a monster like that. And this is bizarre, honestly. As they all start running in different directions, Vigilante is thinking, <laughs> I kind of thought a giant housefly would scare the dickens out of them. 
Resuming his normal shape, Vigilante confronts General Twiddle and General Diddle. Yes, Veg is standing with the two generals, and he says, Now that you know what I can do, hombres, you better not rile me. General Twiddle, the chap in the red, replies, We'll be careful, stranger. From now on, we'll only fight each other. You won't do that neither, amigos. I found a way to settle your argument. To which Twiddle says, Ah, you've decided we're right, of course. No, interrupts Diddle. He's decided that we're right. You're both right, but instead of speaking your remarks, you gotta sing them. And both generals exclaim, Sing Sing them! them! The vigilantes' new music students are hardly likely to find success in opera, but soon... Yes, what we see here are both armies all lined up separately from each other, and vigilante is using a stick to conduct them. A straight line is the shortest distance between two points. A straight line is the shortest distance between two points. A straight line is the shortest distance between two points. A straight line is the shortest distance between two points. Vigilante spreads his arms wide at this magnificent sonic spectacle and declares, Perfect. With the great quarrel settled, the vigilante heads for home, using his newly acquired powers to take a shortcut through the cracks in the ground itself. And with that, vigilante elongates his body and jumps into a hole in the ground, thinking, This stretching sure makes getting home a cinch. I just hope the rest of the seven soldiers are there to meet me. And we round out with a nice image of the seven soldiers all stood around with Willie Wisher sat on a table in front of them and a caption reads Next issue with all of the seven soldiers of victory out of the land of magic they once again face the wily Willie Wisher for the startling conclusion to this amazing adventure Fantastic And we now move to the concluding chapter of the seven soldiers of victory's adventure land of magic from Adventure Comics issue 443, published on the 30th of October, 1975. So, a couple of things I want to point out from Adventure 443 on the cover. It's a nice main image of Aquaman and a dolphin, but trying to capture Aquaman in a line as a bad guy who's called the Fisherman. A sensational supervillain out to hook Aquaman. And this is cover dated February 76, listeners. And within its pages, there is a full page of house advertisements featuring not only the return of Black Hawk to regular publication, but... Issue 58 of All-Star Comics, the great series of the Golden Age of Comics and the all-new All-Star Comics, blah, 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 which gives you an idea, listeners, of where we'll be reaching in the next few months. Mm -hmm. So, listeners, we're nearly there. Page one, we have a massive Seven Seven Soldiers Soldiers of Victory. Victory. At the top, and down the left, we have some captioning. From land, from sea, and through the air, the Laws Legionnaires have made their way back from the outrageous land of magic where they were exiled by Willie Wisher, the incredible imp whose slightest wish becomes reality. So in this, the final reel of John Showen's epic film documentary on the Lost Legionnaires, we will finally see the... Confrontation. Confrontation! A caption beneath that logo reads... Chapter 7 of the classic adventure we found in our files in the form of a 30-year-old script and had illustrated for your reading pleasure. And we get the credits. Script, Joe Samichson. Art, Dick Dillon and Text Plays Dell. Editor, Joe Orlando. Now this splash image is fantastic because we see Willie Wisher standing in a sort of rocky spot of land and the members of the Seven Soldiers all arriving. Now, significantly, we see Green Arrow and Speedy arriving in the back of a comet. We see Sir Justin and Wynne Victory just flying in, Crimson Avenger and Wing just running in, arriving. On the crest of a wave, and the back of their whale friend, fresh from the adventure of the cartoon animals, it's the Star Spangled Kid and Stripesy, and, last but by no means least, emerging from a hole in the ground that he's just probably stretched himself into back in Magic Land, it's none other than Greg Sanders, the vigilante. The heroes look tremendous. They all line up opposite to Willie Wisher, and Star Spangled Kid says, Now, Mr. Wisher, it's time we settled things. You possess a dangerous gift. Vigilante says, And you sure raised a ruckus with it. Willie replies, Oh, that's nothing compared to what I could do if I tried. Like, I wish there were a great big steel wall between us so that you'd stop bothering me. 
Magically, a wall of solid steel appears, but... So Justin is not daunted. He uses his magic blade and slices a disc out of the steel wall, saying, "'Tis to no avail, Willy Wisher, for my enchanted blade will cut through any steel." Hmm. Let's see how you do against these gorillas I've wished up. They're vicious beasts. Don't you think you'd better run? Yes, we get some more Ersatz animated gorillas in the pages of Adventure Comics. The heroes all face them as the Crimson Avenger says, Not yet, pal. The Crimson Avenger shatters a tiny glass capsule and a crimson cloud arises. Yes, the red smoke indeed rises up and surrounds the gorillas. What they can't see, they can't hurt. Which makes them so mad they're fit to be tied. And I reckon I'll oblige him. And he lassoes the three gorillas, and a golden glow seems to build from their feet, surrounds them, and they fade out completely, and a thoughtful Willie Wisher says, That wasn't tough enough for you. It seems that I need to wish up some more intelligent bodyguards. Professional thugs, maybe. It is no sooner wished than... We're with Stripes in a Star Spangle Kid, as we see, out of nowhere, half a dozen rough-looking young men running towards them. Stripes, he says, Gosh, kid, look who's here. Don't they kind of make you feel at home? To which Sylvester says, I sure do, Stripesy. Signal R76. This usually throws them for a loop. As he bodily hurls the Star Spangle Kid right into the path of one of the approaching youths, who exclaims, Oof! And this usually finishes them off. When he has grabbed one of the other young hoodlums by the heels, swinging him around, knocking his friends over. And we see that Star Spangle Kid is doing the same thing. Stripesy says, Gee, kid. I could do this with my eyes closed. I think they're better off closing their eyes, Stripesy. It makes the trick a lot easier. Seconds later, with the thugs vanquished... Yes, the heroes can only stand and watch as Willie Wisher seems to fly off on the back of a broomstick. Goodness me. And as he goes, Willie waves back to them, saying, You boys are pretty good. I think it's time I left so I can decide what to do with you in peace. We then see Green Arrow and Speedy looking very dynamic as they fire arrows with lines attached after Willy. Green Arrow says, No you don't, Willy. We can decide right now. And as you'd expect, the arrows with the lines on them tangle up his broomstick, sending him flying. Green Arrow says, Better get a horse. And Speedy says, Hope you don't land with too much of a bump. As he goes flying, Willy exclaims, My, my, thanks, but don't worry. All I have to do is wish for a big pillow. And he lands in a big checkered pillow that's materialised. Speedy observes, Phew, that appeared just in the nick of time. The heroes all stand in the line again. We see Green Arrow, the Shining Knight, Stripes, the Vigilante, Speedy, the Star Spangle Kid, Wing, and the Crimson Avenger. As Willie faces them, saying, How oh, I've learned to wish fast, but let me see what I can think of to plague you next. The Crimson steps forward at this point. Wait a minute, Willie. Before you go to any more trouble, suppose you let us Legionnaires talk this over. Go ahead. No matter what you cook up, you won't be able to get the better of me. And even if you did manage to get rid of me, I've made sure you'll never forget me. Crimson turns to the others. He's right, men. If we keep up like this, we'll never get the better of Willy. He's just playing with us. Green Arrow says. Yes, and when he gets tired of playing, he'll wish us thousands of miles away like last time. The Star Spangle Kid chips in with. We've no choice but to outthink him then. And so, brains are racked to the limit. And soon... The Crimson's the first to speak when he says. Willy... The more we think about you, the more impressed we are. Why, your powers are terrific. With powers like yours, you can do a lot of good. Or harm. And Wing says, That's right, and without you even knowing it. Willie looks thoughtful for a moment. Harm? I don't mean any harm. To which Speedy says, But you must have done plenty of it. Suppose you just wish for some money, and at once, it's in front of you. And then Star Spangle Kid says, But where did it come from? Maybe from a poor man who needed to pay off his mortgage? And the shiny knight says, Or mayhap, from a widow supporting her needy brood. Gee, I never thought of that. Green Arrow says, Yes, Willie, we know your intentions were never bad, but it's men like you who do the most damage. And a very sad-looking stripesy says, When I think how many people you must have hurt without meaning to, I feel just awful. <laughs> And Willie himself also starts to cry here, saying, Oh, and you make me feel just awful. I feel so bad. I wish I'd never been born. And then he vanishes with a... Green Arrow says, Gosh, he disappeared. Just like we figured he would. Shining Knight offers, Yes, he wished he had never been born. And now it's as if he never had. In fact, it's like he never even existed. 
back to the movie screen again. And we're back in the cinema theatre. We can see on the screen the large words, THE END, and the image of the seven soldiers and wing as Willie vanishes from in front of them. The silhouette form of John Showman says, Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our show. I thank you. But the crowd aren't too happy. Whoa! Showman, you're a cheap fraud. Yeah, how come this wasn't in the papers? Get out of here, faker. We get a close-up of Showman looking very upset as he says, But what it is real, Willie Wishes Magic let me make this film. You mean studio magic helped you? No, doesn't anyone believe me? And we see the seven soldiers emerging from the audience in the next panel, with Star Spangle Kid saying, We do, Mr. Showman, but we never thought we'd see this movie. And Green Arrow says, When we, Willie, wished he was never born, all the effects of his wishes vanished, except this. A nice shot of Vigilante here looking very thoughtful and hopefully he's going to explain everything to me because I'm very confused. You know, partners, I think I've got this figured out. Remember when Willie said he'd made sure we'd never forget him? Crimson continues Vigilante's line of thinking. You're right. He could have meant he was going to leave this film behind to remind the world of his career. But on the other hand, it could mean that Willie just decided to vanish for a while and took some of his magic tricks with him. He could be back. And what do we do then? And the seven soldiers and John Schumann all look very thoughtful as a small caption reads, The End. Well then, we got there. Yay! Great, yes, well done, us. <laughs> well done, everyone involved. Yes. Thank you all for fitting into David's living room. Yes. yes. Put that down. Brandon, if you stand up, Mark can get a seat. Anyway, the vigilante story was fascinating. Mm, mm-hmm. The contrast between the death on the movie set or the drug smuggling one with the snow and all that sort of stuff that we did a while ago. <laughs> yes. it's, um, I, I feel it's a long time since we did those stories, but I'm feeling whiplash, quite yes. frankly. It was the futility of war. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> yes. Which I suppose is actually quite appropriate. <laughs> yes. And it seems appropriate that a prairie troubadour would solve it with a sing song. Yes. It's, you know, it's amazing. It's true, absolutely true to the character. And it's something that's not always played up on. Golden Age Vigilante stories. It does come up from time to time, mm. but it's great that it basically centres and is solved by that. Yes. As opposed to any of his lariats or gun shooting skills or, yes. his, or his spurs, which uh-huh. generally save the day in yeah. the Golden Age. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. I mean, it would have been really funny if like, in, the, in last year's Big Summer Seven Soldiers epic, if he'd got Green Arrow and Black Canadian Johnny Thunder to join him and a little sing along. <laughs> I can imagine Kelly's face if I'd asked her to sing. Could you sing it like this? What? <laughs> she would have said now let, let's all sing Coward of the County yes that would have been very, that, that would have been very amusing no that was that was a lot of fun I mean I'm not as familiar with the vigilante stories as you are but that was mm-hmm. that was interesting I don't obviously I don't know how atypical it was I guess certainly we've done a couple of stories on the show yeah. um, and they've all seemed quite grounded mm-hmm. in comparison so that was quite fun I mean all the chapters have been quite out there I suppose but yes I think along with the the Pat and Sylvester one, it was probably the most out there. I suppose, uh-huh. But I suppose Ollie and Roy were talking to Heavenly Bodies Come to Life, so it was all out there. <laughs> really, what we're talking about. I'm tired, listeners. We've recorded four episodes today. That was a lot of fun. And the conclusion there, uh-huh. Dick Dillon's artwork was phenomenal. Yeah, it's great to have him back drawing the Los Legionnaires. I love it. I love that splash image. Mm-hmm. That's one of the pages of original art that I found for this story. Oh, superb. You know, I've looked at it obviously many times, but just seeing the full context there of knowing exactly what's yeah. going on with Ollie and Roy and the comet and Vig climbing the hole in the ground, all the that whale. is. Ah, fantastic. That's joyous. I like that mm. a little bit. It's quite interesting because, in a way, Willie kind of reminds me of, oh, was it Charlie X from Star Trek? Yes. Uh huh. Uh-huh. You know, in a way, this is a really young person, mm-hmm. well, seemingly a very young person, yeah. with enormous powers. Yep. And he probably hasn't really quite grasped the extent of his abilities. Nope. It's uh, no maturity yeah. at all. And yes. that's the thing. That's, I think, why everyone looks so pensive at the end, because they uh-huh. sort of think, right, oh, wow, well, wait a minute. If he, this guy actually figures out what he's capable of, we could yep. be in a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. Absolutely no explanation as to who he is or where he's from. No. It's just the pixie years. I think he's probably a fifth dimensional limp, for, you know, like Batmite and uh, sure. Mr. Mixed yes, but like That makes sense. The one thing I'm sort of slightly positive about is we didn't see John Showman and his crew at any point during the chapters. I was going to say exactly the same thing. Jinx, <laughs> so, I mean, are we supposed to imagine that they were just all off camera pointing and shooting and taking alternate shots and getting high angles and low angles yeah. and, and cutaways? And at no point did any of the heroes turn around and talk to them? At no point did any of the people they encountered turn yeah. around and talk to them? I mean, <laughs> did they? Sh- how did they get into the castle? How did they shrink down? How did they? Mm. Did their reflections maybe come to life? It no, was just know. the power of the land of magic. 
I suppose. Or did Willie sort of send them into some sort of objective place where they, they were able, almost like us as the readers or the viewers, to take it all in and record it? I don't know. Possibility. Yes. Possibly, you know, who can say? Who, who can, can say? say? Gosh. Mm. I hope this has all worked quite well, listeners. <laughs> At this point in the proceedings today, on the 8th of August, I've no clue. <laughs> I was losing the will to live as we record, because what was the other one we did? We recorded Brave and Bold 118 this morning. Yes. And it was two weeks before this that we recorded the last two Spectre episodes that Steve and I did. So all the recording is all over the place at the yep. moment. I'm just going to throw all the tapes up into the air and see where they land. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so hopefully this will all have made sense. But again, it was an interesting story. Like, uh-huh. it's a shame that they didn't do more with the Seven Soldiers. Very true. Very no, true. After that- bringing them back in GLA uh-huh. 100 and all that. Yes. It would have been nice if they'd got maybe an ongoing book in the same way that the Freedom Fighters and the JSA mm-hmm. did, you know. Mm-hmm. Looking at how some of the artists worked in these chapters, it would, it would have been amazing to see if Dick yeah. Dillon had drawn it or if Mike Grell had drawn it or I know. Yeah. even Howard Chaikin had drawn the whole thing. Can you imagine? Yeah, I'll imagine it right now. It would have been phenomenal. And this, again, being the first stories that we've done that have got Chaikin art, uh, Mike Grell art and uh, Garcia Lopez art. Yes. Just all phenomenal artists. And yep. it's like the first time we're encountering them on the podcast. I know. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I see listeners originally are planning for this one had been we were just going to do it in two episodes and we, Pete and I were just going to read it all through but then obviously you know as I said I think in part one of this that we thought it'd be good to get everyone back so again mm-hmm. thanks to Brandon for re- coming back as Sylvester thanks to Steve for coming back as Pat thanks to Dan for coming back as Sir Justin thanks to Logan for coming back as, as Roy for what must be the sixth time <laughs> sixth, seventh time Chuck playing a different iteration of Indeed. Green Arrow the original Earth 2 version yeah, exciting because we thought, with no disrespect, we thought we'd get Chuck to do it rather than Tony this time because Chuck is our Green Arrow. Yes. And, you know, the legend that is Ranger Gord giving voice to Vigilante. Again, really glad we, we got to do that for him. And, and Pete and I just took the Crimson and Wing for ourselves just so that we'd have something to say. But as yeah, usual... that's true. As usual, we've ended up having to do a couple of us here and there. <laughs> Martin Gray, of course, came in as John Showman. Yes. Making his Earth 2 podcast Martin, debut. Martin, Martin, thank you so much for, for taking the time. It, mean, it means a lot for you to join in and take part. It's hilarious. It's great. Welcome. And we will have you back at some point. Tony from the Awesome Comics Podcast with Serlin the Magician. And Vince from the Awesome Comics Podcast also came in as the Jester because, of course, on social media it's called Jester Diablo. It's like it was meant to be. I know. I insisted he played that part. And also he was Father Time. Yep. Our pal Kelly Blair with her cameo as the baseball bat. Check out Kelly's Presca Prison podcast wherever you can. My wife Christine again joined us uh, to play the moon, which was fantastic. Yep. And a big thank you to Kenny Smith, of course, regular contributor and runner of the Power of Three podcast. And Pieces of Eight. Don't forget Pieces of Eight. And Pieces of Eight, yes. yes. But you turn off in Power of Three more often than Pieces of Eight. I do. But Kenny turns up in both of them. That's so yes, mm. Kenny's contributions, Mercury, much appreciated. Thanks very much to Ross from Stop Let's Team Up for being King Misty Brain for us. <laughs> yes, um, amazing. Thank you, Ross. Always appreciated. Our thanks to Ross because he always gives us a lot of support on the socials and we really enjoy his Opal City Confidential Starman podcast. Of course, everything else. Ross is great company listeners. Honestly, he's great for a long walk. He's brilliant. Thanks to the irredeemable Shag as King Adalbert the Adult. We should mention that Shag's Justice League podcast is wound up now and he's launched a new one via Justice Society Presents where he's going to cover the Justice Society of America stories from the 1990s. And we cannot wait. Yeah, because that's, that's stuff that obviously we won't be doing in the Earth 2 podcast. Uh-huh. So we wish Shag all the best with that. We look forward to hearing everything. I can't wait till he gets to the Parabek stuff. I love that series. It was great. I hope you're going to do Armageddon Inferno as well, Mr. Matthews, while you're here. Anyway, and we should also mention Max and Rich of the Weird Warriors, who played General Twiddle and General Diddle. Who else could we get to play, as the caption said, the characters from the weirdest of wars? Indeed. Mm. Thanks as well also to Aaron Newarth, who played the, the, the lion for us. Aaron has been a recurring guest on Brandon's Summer of 2004 at 20 podcast this year. And of course, Brandon regularly pops up on Aaron's podcast out now with Aaron the Nabe. Hi folks, I'll jump in here because I would also like to thank comic writer Al Ewing and comic artist Frank Quitely for their cameo performances as John Showman's hecklers in the final scene. Something I kept so secret, David's only finding out about it just now. Thanks, guys. And, of course... Last but not least. Last, but by no means least. The John Hart to our David Tennant and Matt Smith. <laughs> our pal Steve Higgins. Join me in this, as we discuss the Spectres' escapades in the Venture Comics. A huge, massive thanks 
to our buddy, Vacuum Boy 9 himself, Mr. Steve Higgins. Hey. Above and beyond, so many ways this year. Steve, you're a legend. We'll get you back on again soon. Don't you worry about that. Thank you so much. Indeed. And if you want to find out more about all of our contributors, then we've got links to all of their shows in our show notes. So yes, please check out all their stuff because they're fantastic guys. That's why we wanted them on. Yes. I'm sure that a few folk will be back because there's a couple of recurring characters due before too long. So Kelly and Chuck can start warming up. (laughs) Now that thanks are out the way, listeners, we can jump to the contemporary correspondence, such as it was. So there's just a couple of bits to give you, unfortunately. There's not a lot of detail. Issue 441. There's a little bit of comment. Tail end of a letter from Clint Buck Thomas, Oak Hill, West Virginia. We might have read this out when we talked about the Spectre story, but Clint says, I truly enjoy the first instalment of the SSV serial. It's an interesting concept in having modern day artists draw a 30 year old story. Howie Chaikin's graphics in the Shining Night segment were a joy to behold. It looks like 1975 is going to be a terrific year for DC and us fans. Well, that's nice. And there's another letter from Mike White, Mackinac. Illinois? Yep. And he says, Dear Joe, I like the current back features very much, but don't overdo it. Try rotating Aquaman with other superheroes. As for the Seven Soldiers of Victory, I'd waited several months for their debut, and to say the least, I was astounded. Joe Samichson knew what to write, and Dick Dillon knows what to draw. His rendition of the group was great. Howie Chaikin's Shining Night was different, but pleasing. I look forward to seeing the rest of the story. And the editorial response is, Speaking of the Seven Soldiers, we've yet to decide what will replace them when their tenure in adventure is up. Interesting. Mm. There's one other little fragment to give you, listeners, from the tail end of a letter from Joe Wisnack, Monteville, New Jersey. We might have read this out when we did the Spectre story, I'm not, I'm not sure, but tail end of his discussion on the voice that doomed the Spectre, he says, Speaking of insanity, I loved Father Time's In. It was a nice, whimsical counterpoint to the morbid drama of the lead feature. Adventure Comics is one of the few DC series I look forward to, and issues like 439 remind me why. Well, that appears to be it for the correspondence. Oh, well. Not very much at all. I was hoping for a couple of big long missives where people would sort of rave about the Seven Soldiers and demand an ongoing series, but... Sadly not. Such is life. It's going to be a long time before we see the full team again, isn't it? Yep, the Lost Legionnaires will return eventually, but not anytime soon. No, they will see the whole team in All-Star Squadron when we get there. But, as Pete remembers correctly... Vigilante, the Earth-1 version, will be popping up again fairly soonish in the podcast. Yeah, I think it's World's Finest, some World's Finest stories he's got. Mm-hmm. And then there's, there's also an interesting twist on Legacy involving the Vigilante mm-hmm. in a story from Detective Comics. But we'll tell you about that much nearer the time. We certainly shall, yes. Listeners, thank you so much. This has been very interesting, doing the Seven Soldiers story. It's a shame they didn't find a couple more. Yeah, very true. And if you want to check out the original script for this, it's at the very back of the Seven Soldiers of Victory Archive, Volume 3. What's interesting is the original Golden Age script differs quite a bit, actually, from what was actually published. Yes. So, yeah, feel free to have a look at it, compare them, because they kept the whole feeling of the story, but some of the chapters are out of order, some of the dialogue's different, some of the characters are slightly different. It's really interesting to compare them. Yes, I'd recommend, agreed, yeah, definitely. Very interesting, especially having recorded and read out all the stories compared to what, you know, It's yes, it's fascinating. It's just mm-hmm. a shame they didn't reprint the whole story in the, the archive as well. In a parallel universe, they did. Probably. Ah, yes. oh, will we find that parallel universe on the show? Who can say? Right, anyway, let's let's do the wrap up. Let's Indeed, do the wrap up. Indeed, yes. So you know what we thought of the story? Why don't you tell us what you thought about it? You can email us at theearth2podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you follow us on social media because we're putting up some lovely bonus material for this and indeed every episode. On Facebook and Instagram, we're at the Earth 2 podcast and at Twitter at podcast underscore Earth 2. And it is the number two for all our social media. Yes, be sure to check out Instagram and Facebook because I've got a couple of foreign reprints of some of the Aquaman covers, which is worth sharing. Why not? And I found a couple of pages of original art from the final chapter as well, so we'll throw them up and you can have a look and go, ooh, isn't that nice? But yes, as usual, we'll put some story highlights across all the socials so you can have a look at what we've been talking about if you don't have the issues to hand. Wouldn't it have been nice if it had been reprinted? Oh, well, not to worry. Right, anyway, The Seven Soldiers, it's been... Nice to have you back. We'll see you at some point in the future, I'm sure, won't we? Indeed. Yes. It's going to be weird next summer when we don't do a Seven Soldiers multicast <laughs> epic, isn't it, listeners? We'll have to find someone else. Mm, to, we'll to have do. to find some other kind of SSV type, maybe. Mm. Yes, if you enjoyed this, or indeed any of our other episodes, please go to wherever it is you receive your podcast and leave us a positive review. That would be lovely. If you're feeling very generous, you can go to our coffee page and buy Peter the Price of a Beverage so he can sit and 
warm himself and Cafe Nero as the nights start drawing in and the morning starts staying a little darker for longer and he has to edit out all of our weary and bitchy sniping <laughs> as we go through this epic story. I think it's been worth it. Hopefully you have too. On that bombshell. I've been Peter. I've been David. We'll see you soon, folks, on... The Earth 2 Podcast! Transmatter cube activated. Return coordinates set for Earth Prime. <laughs> they said Sylvester McCoy. <laughs> Ace! Try that again.